everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's afternoon here, uh, 4 p.m. by my time here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on game development and the African game market. My name is Gregory Aldi. I am uh, the business director for Ray Global Digital in Nigeria here. Today, moving forward to the program, I'll be introducing uh, the speaker for this session. He is Corey Bello, the CEO of uh, Red Global Digital. Mr. Kilo. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, wherever you're watching from, I think we have somebody uh, um, joining from Atlanta, Georgia. So I don't know if it is morning or afternoon. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, uh, whatever the time is. My name is Corey De Bello. Um, popularly, uh, people know me as Kabel. Of course, I'm the founder and the CEO of Ray Global Digital, uh, the company responsible for this seminar. And uh, one of the reasons why we are doing this is primarily to encourage the African community to do, uh, to step into the arena of game industry because it's, it's not yet pronounced like the other um, industries in Africa. So I'll get started. What I want, what I'll be talking about today is I want to talk about the African gaming industry market. When we are talking about the African game or gamification in Africa, when we're talking about the market, it's a very brand new uh, concept. What I'll be talking about today, the highlights, I will talk about uh, what is the aim is game popular in Africa, the potential of the gaming market in Africa, the mobile case, the future and the market. We are not superhero, but we could be. Then I'll conclude. I have less than 20 minutes now. All right, what's the aim? The aim actually is to educate African youth uh, to impact uh, the, on the impact of video game in innovation, the game, uh, gamification of economy and the future of digital Africa. Uh, meaning we want to encourage the African youth on the importance of game industry uh, because it's not yet uh, pronounced just like I've, I've said before. Also, we want to call the attention of the investors because primarily one of the major challenges that um, game industry is facing right now in Africa is funding. Um, and especially if you are in game industry, you will know that uh, for a startup to really pick up or to launch, you need a lot of support that you can get. But that is one of the major challenge, uh, challenges that the African communities are facing right now. Then of course, we also want to reemphasize the fact that Africa is not a single entity. There is, um, there is a kind of a misconception that uh, knowingly or unknowingly, people tend to generalize Africa as a single entity, like treat Africa like a country. Africa is not a country, it's a continent. And why am I, uh, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because Africa has a, a, a lot of potential when it's come to game niche, when it's come to um, coming up with ideas, when it's come to culture, when it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to... So right now, Africa is very rich when it comes to idea because we can come from different angles. And why am I even talking about this? I'm talking about this because those game industry that we have right now is either we are following after um, the niche that has been, uh, that, are, that has been in operation in the developed countries already. So. I think it's high time that Africa need to start to take a look at how they can use their rich heritage to come up with a very good and better niche. Then of course, the aim is to break the barrier of limited spotlights on Africa game development industry. Uh, this, is, this is one of the, uh, one of our vision at Ray Global Digital. We want the Africans to be well-educated about game industry, that these things are possible. And we also want to place uh, the, create more awareness so that the rest of the world can come on board uh, with the African community to fight 
um, whatever might be the delay that will be responsible for the reason why the game industry in Africa are not really that are not really flying as the rest of the game industries are flying all over the world. Then we want to create the bridge that connect the Finnish game industry with Africa. Just like I said, I am based in Finland. Uh, Finland is where I choose to live. And I want, I would like, and Finland is very um, well known when it comes to game industry. Finland is successful. We have the like of uh, Angry Birds and Co doing great exploits. So we want to see how Finland as a country can influence game industry or gamification in Africa. So gaming in Africa, is gaming gaining popularity in Africa? So that's the, that's the first question that one needs to first ask before we start to talk about whether uh, there is a um, market for game industry. Um, the answer that I've come up with is yes and no. Why? Because the thing is this, when we are talking about game industry, we are talking about um, we are talking about in Africa, when we are talking about countries that are the lead, um, that are popular, popularly known with game industry, we are talking about the like of South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda, and maybe some other few other countries. Uh, but still, you um, these countries, they are facing uh, one of the major challenges that they are facing right now is the fact that even the indigenous people might not even patronize what they are producing. Because right now, is people don't really take games seriously. When During my generation, I don't know about the current generation because I left Nigeria in 2008, so we are still taking a look into deeper, uh, deep, uh, a deeper look into how the market is. Gaming, we believe that people that play games, they don't have job, uh, meaning they, they are not serious and other stuff. Uh, but as a result, a lot of youth that might have potential in game, uh, in, in game uh, development started to lose um, interest because they don't believe that it could be a business. It could generate income. It could employ people. So it's that's the reason why I say yes and no. Yes, game industry, the exploit um, of mobile game has uh, increased a lot, of, a lot of a lot of reasons why game uh, gaming in Africa is increasing and people start to develop games, create games. Then the market is getting bigger and bigger gradually, but it's not really that a, a very fast growth. As at, as at now that we are, that we are doing this um, seminar. Of course, everybody knows that game, gamification is a very huge global industry that worth billions of dollars uh, worldwide because it's one of the market that is growing very fast. But like I've said before, in Africa, it's not really uh, moving very fast like the rest of the world. So, um, local content created by Africans for African need to uh, need fund to expand. I think this is one of the major things that Africa need right now. Um, as at right now, Africa is one of the uh, continents of the world that is having increase in population at a very um, fast rate. Africa is really increasing in population at a very fast rate. So that's just it. So. Having said this, like I've been talking about game industry in, Mac, in Africa, so I would like to quickly talk about some few game uh, studios in Africa that are doing, that they, they are fighting the war, they are fighting the battle at the forefront at, the, at this, um, fighting this war. So in 2012, there is a studio in Nigeria called Maliyo Game. They, become, uh, they became the very first video game companies in West Africa. That was in 2012. And in Kenya, um, a formerly known uh, game industry called Black Division. It's well known in Nairobi uh, for creating, in, in Kenya, for creating a game uh, that they call 
narrow me x and narrow me x is just about alien invasion in in uh, in our in Nairobi, kenya then we have free lives uh, free lives this they they they, they are one of the uh, most successful companies game uh, development game company right now in, in africa in 2012 they recorded over 250,000 copies uh, in sales when it's come so it means even though we are fighting this war this guys are still uh, managing to to exploit and succeed even though they did not really have access to fund like the rest of the world in 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 front of uh, that in front when it's come to game development and kiro o games in 2013 they released uh, their first game and before even they released the full game they raised 270 dollars in funding it was launched in Lagos. I, I think uh, this is one of the game industry, a uh, game company that are doing very good uh, right now in Nigeria. They've released over um, around 60 games since founded. So now when we talk about what is the potential of gamification in Africa, naturally game, game, when it comes to playing game, it comes naturally to young people. And right now, according to the research, uh, between zero and 24 years of age, the, the, it, has been, um, it has been predicted that the population of Africa is going to increase by 50%. So, and if that is going to happen, I think within that range of age, are the are people that play game most. So many, if, the African game industry are well stabilized and well established. They are going to do great things when it comes to game industry and when it comes to generating incomes for themselves. So the African game industry is increasing. Um, I'm, uh, African game market is increasing, which will pave way to a lot of game developer that um, maybe are from around the world. We are so much concerned about the indigenous indigenous uh, game developers. So there is one point I want to mention. The reason why I want to mention this is Iron Adventure, not just charity. Everybody known Africa for you know charity, you hear of UNICEF, you know this, the major reason why a lot of people are going to Africa is to help the poor to help. Africa don't just need charity, Africa needs support. So I'm, I'm, um, the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning this point is that if you are an expert in game and you have passion for Africa, you like adventure, I think it's high time for you to start to take that step uh, to collaborate, to get engaged, engage the African market. It's not going to be easy from the beginning to be sincere. We have to face that reality, but it is possible. With the little help from uh, the well-developed country that have access to funding, I want to tell you, the, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. The sky is not the limit. Um, all right. Now, one of the reasons why I will talk about the mobile case. When I'm talking about the mobile case, I'm talking about um, you, the usage of mobile phones, smartphones. It's one of the things that, that we make uh, that are solidified game industry in Africa, uh, those that are really at least trying their best. It's one of the things that have solidified and it's making African game markets look more promising every day. Um, the rate at which people are using mobile right now, smartphone right now, almost everybody is using it right now in Africa. It doesn't even matter where you are living, whether you are living in the city or you are living in the rural area. So. In West Africa, um, uh, about in particular, 50% of the, uh, um, the the mobile game uh, of 50% of the mobile game players, the uh, of game players, they use mobile to play their game. That was according to the uh, the, the report on two, in 2019. In North Africa alone it is estimated that over 290 million people currently own cell phones. So and one of the reasons why it is very 
uh, it's, uh, things are progressing is because GPS and Bluetooth on smartphone makes smartphone popular. Uh, please, if I am overspending my time, please let me know so that I can quickly rush. I forgot to set my stopwatch. Yes, we are not. Fine. You have five minutes. Left. I have five minutes left. Thank you so much. All right. Like I've already said, that we are not superhero. We are not all superheroes, but we could be. What is my duty? That is the next question I want you to ask yourself, especially if you have if you are passionate about Africa. I'm talking I'm talking to this to the foreigners now. That's one that are passionate about Africa. They want to see game industry boom in Africa. And at the same time, I'm talking uh, to the indigenous of Africa, whether you are living in the diaspora or you are living in Africa. What is your duty? One of the things. Um, Africa, naturally, we have markets. We have potential markets when it comes to game industry. Why? Because we have the population and we are developing at a very fast rate and the economy of Africa is booming. So I will now ask myself, what will be my role? Like you should also ask yourself. First thing first, get proper education when it comes to game development. You, because game development is very huge. Um, is a is a is an industry that it has a lot of areas and angles. It's not just one, what one person can achieve. But you play your role, get proper education. You can learn to be a designer, a game designer, a programmer, a level designer. The list goes on and on and on and on. Then, if you have the capability, provide education for those that doesn't have. That is one of the reasons why uh, what gave back to Ray Global Digital Academy. We want, especially people that, that need motivation, that need experience, we provide that for them. And uh, so I um, built strong network, meaning let's connect. Ray Global Digital, we have a, a game network. So if you are interested, you can get in touch with us. Then adventure, many reach out, the possibilities are endless. In conclusion, as there are um, promise that the African game market is huge, is big, it has potential. Also, there are little challenges. Um, I've already explained this that game patient come naturally to young people. This can lead to meaningful work and economic exploitation. Then what is the challenge? The challenge is first and foremost, when I was preparing for this, it was a bit challenging to even get materials. How do you collect the data that does not exist on an understudied industry or subject? So it's one of the major challenges that game industry is having. A lot of African game developers, they don't have reference. They don't have uh, uh, a kind of uh, a mentoring company that they can follow after. Then I will also say that it's proved uh, difficult to answer questions like, how many percentage play game per day in Africa? Because if you are talking about African market, when it's come to game industry, you have to take a look at who are the potential players, who can buy the game. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit difficult to know this because of the lack of uh, statistic, proper statistic and other stuff. In conclusion, like I said, African game uh, market is increasing. Uh, it has a lot of great potential. If you have any question, I think now is the time to ask. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, what do you think is the first step to achieve in this path? For, Can you repeat that again, please? Um, what's the first thing you should do when you when you begin with this path? I mean, what is your like vision here? How are you gonna achieve this? All right. Okay. So if you are talking about me or somebody else that have interest, if you are talking about me, how am I going to achieve this? This is one of the ways uh, I'm going to achieve this. Of course, we have already started. Like Ray Global Digital Academy yeah. is an example. Uh, we are providing training. Uh, we are uh, uh, helping people get more bolder when it's come to game development by offering internship, 
self-learning, meaning learning at work, or maybe you want to write your thesis. Uh, Nico, I think, Nico, you are the one who asked the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about uh, very uh, deeply. If anybody wants to ask a question about this, you can get in touch with me afterward, or you can ask a question right now. So this is one of the ways uh, I, I am planning to achieve this. Then we have forming network of game developer or people that have interest. So a lot of people have interest, they want to learn about it, but the way educations are right now in Africa, it has not really accommodate game developer. So it's, it's one of the uh, ways at which uh, I'm trying to achieve this. So I don't know if I, 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 I'm able to answer your question. Yes, Thank it is. All right. Very much, Mr. Kuridi. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. So it was a cycle. So we, we now know what it is. From what you've said, we've been able to gather uh, you know, this, this kind of data on this, uh, not so much data on the game industry in Africa. So, but um, the game industry was leveraged on the broadband, leveraged on the smartphone. And I'm sure that uh, according to the ASNA uh, report published in 2019, there was, there was about 749 million, you know, uh, active mobile phone users in sub-Saharan, where Nigeria and so that's where it's Africa when you sub-Saharan Africa. So it's an untapped resource when it comes to Nigeria. So what I'm just going to like, uh, my field study, my field study and my observation, I grew up here, I know what it is like. We consume the imported game, when it comes to game, as a product, what we consume is more imported product. So it's what we get from the Western world. And I can tell you that uh, though we do not have data, but uh, evidence and uh, what I have seen within the zero to 24 years, even more than the ICT game, we have a PS in my house. So it's an untapped resource. We need to thank you very much. If you have any other question, can you, you can post it in the comment section or chat section and we'll move on. Um, then we'll move on to the next uh, on the list. Okay, my co moderator, I think, okay, over to you. Good. So, hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Ali from Kekoyejo, and I am a doctoral candidate as well as. The research and development manager here at uh, Ray Global Digital. And right now I'll be talking really briefly about Ray Global Digital Academy. Uh, Ray Global Digital focuses on training students through internship and thesis basically on the ongoing project, which is toy culture. At the moment, we can boast of five students who have joined us either through uh, internship or those who are interested in doing some sort of uh, thesis work. The academy started officially in April 2021 and ends in June 2021 also. These students are basically from universities across Finland. And the academic session comes to an end also with the seminar on the 24th of June, where they will be showing basically all they have been doing at the Toy Culture Take a Sneak Peek. And just like the niche, you all will be taking a sneak peek into the prototype of toy culture. Uh, it promises to be an exciting seminar because uh, we all get to see what we've been up to the past year. And also it will be online and the link to the event will be dropped in the comment session. 
other things about Ray Global Digital and what we've been up to throughout the year, for example, is one of our events called Forward, which we launched in May of 2021. And the link to see more details about this can also be seen in the chat. On the 1st of May, we launched Forward with the topic interest in jobs and the state of different industry with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the next episode of Forward focuses on leisure and culture shock. And this will be pretty interesting for those who have traveled around the world. This can also be seen in the links that will be dropped in the, in the uh, chat. We also have Business Ray and so many other interesting things that we do here at Ray Global Digital, and some of which we can also view or watch on TV Ray, which uh, we have a link to that to our website also. And then these shows come on air once in a month. And there are also a host of other shows that we, we host also here at Ray Global Digital. And right now, without any further uh, discussions, I'd like to introduce our next guest, Natasha Skolt. I hope, I hope the pronunciation works right as she talks about game development. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you very much. And it's a huge pleasure to be here and meet you all. My apologies for the amount of light in my room because sun is shining directly, even that the, uh, which is very surprising for Finland, to be honest. So, uh, so yeah, I am going to uh, start sharing my screen now. And if anyone can confirm that you can see my screen. We can see. Excellent. All right. So, uh, first of all, uh, hello from myself here from Mytel, a uh, company from Turku in Finland. Um, as a day job, I'm a CEO director of uh, Mytel. But besides working in my own company with my co founders and fellow employees, um, I'm also having multiple hats in the games industry here in Finland and internationally. Uh, for those who have not heard yet, uh, I will tell a bit about IGDA, uh, because International Game Developers Association has been one of the biggest and most um, um, sustainable, actually, game developers uh, organizations uh, uh, active for the past 27 years. And I have been privileged to work with these professionals for years, and this year also I have been appointed to be a chairperson of IGDA Global. Um, so what does IGDA do is that we are a global network of game developers and also as well as hobbyists, students, academics, pretty much anyone who is passionate about games and also wants to explore the careers in gaming industry. This is where IGDA can help a lot. And there are over 150 chapters and special interest groups um, which are there to support local needs of the game developers uh, and as said, gamers, students, and whoever is uh, uh, interested to learn more about uh, um, this line of work. Um, besides that, I'm locally here because I live in Turku and work in Turku. So I'm one of the founders of Hive Turku Game Hub, which is one of the business centers in Finland. And we have um, kind of under one roof, um, uh, various, uh, let's say, seniority level of development uh, companies uh, and also tech companies that are under one roof. And, and it's all about, again, community network sharing uh, and also co-creation and so forth. Um, as that is not enough, uh, I'm also um, still active in my academic uh, kind of like life as well, besides industry work. Um, as I'm a certified teacher and I'm still teaching actually game design and game art at the University of Turku. Um, and because I'm passionate about education, 
and uh, how we can utilize gaming technology outside of entertainment per se, to which I'm very thankful to be here to actually talk about gamification and what that actually means in practice. Um, this is where in Finland, um, on behalf of Finnish Game Developers Association, I'm one of the representatives for kind of serious games companies in, in Finland. Um, so let's start from the basics. Uh, what my where my passion lays and why I decided even that my background is actually in the uh, kind of more creative industry, meaning art department, but still the business is something that um, I also, uh, well, developed my, my skills uh, uh, throughout the years. And uh, why from the mainstream industry, kind of like creating mainstream um, market-driven games, I decided to, with the, my colleagues, actually create our own company that would be full, like fully focusing on gamification and serious games is because we believe that actually the future of gaming is in utilizing uh, this sort of like gaming technology in the way that can serve the, the specific needs, interest, or pretty much anything else of the individual per se, because this is what technology actually can do nowadays. And this is why I, uh, like in my tale, what we also uh, highly um, focus on is the storytelling. Because through stories, and we are talking here about mainly visual and interactive storytelling, this is something that particularly emotionally gets engaged, engaged with the players or with the users and stays um, kind of intact with the users on a much longer term. Uh, also, Psychologically, we as humans, we react to images and they stay in our, uh, especially audiovisual experience, such as games, stay with us much longer and in more uh, kind of like bigger effect on, on the long run. And this is why we believe that through interactive storytelling and uh, kind of utilizing the newest technologies, we can actually support different types of needs and, uh, and also, uh, like literally from the challenges that someone might be facing in, in learning or in any type of, uh, let's say, for the health professionals, well-being, but also for the industrial engineering, uh, let's say, safety training or any kind of uh, different um, uh, also professionals in their field. This is what our company does. So there is a lot of mis misunderstanding, really, what gamification is. Um, Quite often, and, and in previous, like let's say in the past decade or longer, um, it has been misunderstood. Like the, the, and I can say this as a still, let's say certified teacher in a way that, um, if you think about educational games, um, quite often it would happen that teachers are the ones who are asked to make a game, and teachers don't know anything about making games. What is it? Not even necessarily that they play games. So this is really important aspect of who is actually involved in creating gamified solution. Because when it comes to education, for example, are the teachers the right people to do that? Because they're experts in the curriculum and the ways how learning process of a certain subject on a certain you know, level should happen. But do they know how to make it into actually engaging experience? Not really, and this is something where we can see from the various gamified solutions in the uh, in the previous uh, uh, years in the market that they did not really succeed because kind of wrong people were involved. Um, so, so I will be talking now exactly what it means and how to improve it. Um, but before we go there, I want to ask if anyone here, actually, because I love interacting with, uh, <laughs> with the audience as well, if anyone wants to answer this very simple question, why we play games? Why do people play games? Any kind of games, mobile, PC, console, you name it. Why do you play games? As a child um, or as an adult? Yes, please. Games, games are a way of, of learning information so just like um the the mimicking of our parents in 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 what they do like we mimic their um voice in speaking words we mimic their actions when we see them games are a way of of practicing um 
basic skills in order to get better at them as adults. Thank you for that. Anyone else? A while away time when I play game. I um, do play game maybe when sitting in the bus, traveling, or maybe uh, when sitting in the, when I'm bored, you know. So I just use game to while away time mostly. Yes, that is another. Any other? Uh, why do we play games? Relaxation as well. It relaxes me. I Definitely. don't have to think too much. Definitely. Depends on the game, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, thank you for all the answers. The First of all, the first answer when it comes to mimicking and learning, actually, that's not about the games. It's play. Play, the difference between play, there's a big difference kind of between what it play is and what the game is. Um, and I can talk about it for days, <laughs> but, uh, but now I will just highlight that, yes, you're totally right. You described what play is. Play used to be, especially in the kind of like, sort of like how we, how through play, we actually learn different skills within the safe environment, because as, a, as you play, you don't really, you are not in any risk of kind of, even failure is not necessarily taken as a, as a as a bad thing it's just like you learn by doing and therefore that's the play part but why we really play games is i can tell you from even my and this is where i fit personally as a, as a hardcore gamer my whole life is that being away from this reality so basically stepping into something else that you are not necessarily part or you're experiencing completely different um worlds and pretty much you can uh, fulfill different kind of dreams or fantasies in a way that, for example, you can be a, you know, space crusade, or you can uh, go through the, you know, medieval castles, and you can do this, like, you can do so many things, or you can be a farmer, you can literally through farm simulator, be experience what it is to be a farmer, and many other ways. So this is kind of where what games do. Games are basically the, 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 the um, gateway to fulfilling certain dreams or fantasies or trying different stuff. And we game developers, we are the ones who actually create the building blocks for a player to receive that fantasy. Because even that we as game developers, we design games in so many ways. And we like, especially like design is very strict in, in the essence. So what it really means is that when the players play, very often it happens that players do stuff within the game world that we designers never expected. And this is the beautiful thing and the, the dialogue between games and, um, and the players, I mean, the game developers and the players, because unlike in movies or any other medium where the, there is kind of a monologue from the screen to the viewer, here there is a dialogue between the developer and the developer. And this is the beauty of actually creating this sort of um, ongoing relationship and figuring out really what players want, what kind of um, things we need to uh, uh, tackle further to really get the most out of the planned experience. So this is for the, any kind of game. And otherwise, games are incredible teaching tools because you get to, no matter what game we're talking about, mobile, uh, any free-to-play kind of casual game to you know, hardcore strategy or whatever RPG games they are on the different platforms. Um, every single game teaches a player rules of what is actually possible in that world per se. So rules, place, what do you do? What you're supposed to, like, where are you going? What do you have, what kind of abilities and different things you, you actually have to achieve these goals? And most importantly, how we deal with the failure in games Failure is kind of like you, you, you have this self-motivation to actually get back and do better. Or maybe there are different motivations. Uh, some players want to, you know, get better score or beat the score of their friends. But the point is that there is this personal um, drive that you want to get better. While in the real life, when we face failure, we can face a lot of emotional, um, you know, personal, um, let's say, um, uh, kind of moments where, where, where 
you are not you are not secure in yourself. So a lot of insecurity happens. Um, so this is something that where we believe that uh, utilizing game uh, design approach within the other aspects of everyday life, um, from learning, as I said, healthcare, well-being, pretty much everything. There is a lot of potential that we can actually do to support individual, because we as individuals, even you now listening to me. You might have been having literally a bad day or maybe you didn't sleep enough or maybe you had an awesome day and you can totally focus here. But that's the thing. You never, everything affects us all the time. So we learn things differently. Some are better at doing stuff by hand, some by listening, some by reading by themselves. Um, and this is what it's really important to understand that also when you create a gamified solution, it should be accessible in any way that final user should actually receive such um, content. And gaming, gamified solutions are for professionals to use with their clients or students or however you wanna call them. Um, and it's not to replace them. So this is another really important aspect to, to uh, know. But this is what I wanted to kind of start the discussion of what actually games are uh, because Finland has been very uh, successful with the ed tech side of things and gamification, serious games, and so on. And you can find a lot of information actually on data from, from Finnish and even in, within the EU kind of, because there is a lot of EU um, funded projects actually in, in this area. So there is a lot of data that one can actually uh, take and, and explore. And the reason why Finland has been so good is not really just the money. Um, it's not actually that easy here either to get the funding for, for uh, certain projects. But the reason why it was so successful is because professionals from different fields, let's go back to education. So if we think about teachers, they are super open, open-minded to actually try things out, work together with developers, figure out stuff together, because that is the thing what really makes the gamification work. That means that literally everyone works together from the expertise in their field. So it's not enough to have a teacher, it's not enough to have a designer, but they together with all other narrative designers, artists, audio, like audio designers, everyone has to be on the same page and work together as a whole, even that they not necessarily know each other's obviously expertise in the sense that they are experts in their fields. But this is where a lot of listening and a lot of um, um, co-creation kind of practices take place, which is not easy, especially for someone who does not know anything about the other person's field. But this is where the trust in their expertise is crucial and listening and testing, testing all the time. Um, but one of the good things about gamification, actually, even that it sounds like Okay, it might be kind of how many people there are and it might be actually super expensive, to, but in the long run, it's not. It's actually really cheap and very effective to create certain uh, gamified solution that can be then available globally, if not just for a specific uh, region because of languages and so on. I mean, this is now the depending on what kind of strategy for the product you have, but there is a global uh, impact and it's very easy and fast to kind of get it and, and alter it and pivot and fix it up and adjust it according to the special needs of different users around the world. Um, especially we can see like one of the reasons why mobile games are so successful is exactly with that. How do you actually different cultures, different uh, approaches, different, you know, every single kind of like various markets with the same game in a way, uh, you, you actually have a success. Like Rovio was always mentioned, Supercell games and so on. Um, because of that, how you actually make it that as a design fits different kind of cultures and needs and so on and so on. But that's a completely separate lecture of its own. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to gamification, once again, and besides this sort of uh, list here that I put from the higher user engagement, uh, very rewarding for the person who is uh, using it and so on. But self-governed motivation and learning is the crucial thing. Because if the person finds that gamified 
tool boring, they're not going to use it. And it doesn't matter how many teachers or, or therapists or whoever is forcing someone to do, they will maybe do, but they are not going really to engage with it. So therefore, it's really important to, to focus on the design. And that design works and the professionals in the field that uh, depending on what, let's say, teacher has the final aim for the students to, to learn, that's where designer figures out how to really, in which way, um, introduce certain aspects, but also how to engage with a, a, a player with the specific parts there that it really feels as a full experience, not just facts given or, or answered like, like in quizzes. And this is where we have quite many unsuccessful uh, gamified solutions. And this is where we believe, at least in my team, and I am a strong believer that interactive storytelling is something that can, and stories in general, are something that can help us a lot, especially in breaking that stigma over, you know, educational, healthcare, or any other kind of gamified or serious games kind of thing. Because as long as you have uh, uh, really um, content that really reflects to the user, which games have in general, um, this is where, where the kind of, I think the key lays for, for uh, looking forward. Uh, because one thing to have in mind is that what actually final player always needs to know or needs to know answers to these at least questions is that no matter are you in the beginning of the game in the middle or at the final boss or whatever you're doing it doesn't matter but you always have to be aware of okay where am i like literally in the game what am i doing what am i supposed to do is this challenge ahead of me too hard or is it or can I handle it uh, do I miss something do I need to go collect do I need to level up do I need to so all this information when it comes to can I actually succeed in that challenge is um, essential because this is what information the player needs to get from the game at all times um, and another thing to really uh, have in mind is that expectations of the player because if you are, let's say, searching for a game that you wish to play as a gamer, like you, you, you want to play some new game and you're checking what's available out there. So if, if I see, okay, there is a shooter game and I want to play the shooter game, I'm already having expectation of what kind of game I'm looking for. So this is another thing. If you are, uh, how you present and kind of like what kind of target audience are you really targeting with? And this is especially important for gamification is this sort of to understand what expectations from previous experience uh, people may have, because this is very much over, overlooked in the gamified uh, uh, solutions. While in games, we always think of the kind of like players' expectations kind of first uh, compared to, because gamification can be ran by, let's say, you know, client wants this and that, or let's say teachers or therapists, they want this and that, and you follow the therapist, but you don't even necessarily at that point even think and I'm talking about in the kind of how you shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, the, the player is kind of the last thing you think about. It's not the case. You always have to think first of the player, always. Because at the end of the day, even if teachers cannot play the game, the, the, the actual students should play it. So that's your target audience. And the teachers need to understand what actually happens and how happens, even if they're not necessarily are good gamers and can't necessarily play it, but that's okay. They also need to understand that what actually their, like the target really audience is. Um, and now what does that actually mean in practice? So if we are trying to now put the game development practices with this sort of other, other um, um, whole, let's say, um, industry needs or, or professionals' personal needs in their work and so on. Um, well, first of all, creating this immersive and emotionally engaging experience is one thing, but it's also really important to uh, that story res and story. We're not ever talking about people don't read necessarily, especially not in games. So, uh, and not in mobile games, <laughs> that's, that's for certain. So through visual storytelling and through this sort of visual cues, you are creating that interactive experience and everything else that you actually need to uh, you know, really uh, get interest of, of the player. 
and that especially for the uh, professionals in whichever field they are and they want to have gamified solution a uh, really important part is to create the safe and controlled environment to try new things because in the, for example, therapy sessions and so on, you would have um, a therapist who can also adjust different kinds of things for their client to use. So that means that you can also gather a lot of different data, you can use it for your research, you can do a lot of different things through the game, while the player plays the game. But you can do a lot of different stuff, obviously. So creating this controlled environment, especially for the professionals in different fields is crucial. And um, and yeah, creating this sort of safe place where you can actually try stuff is, is really important. Because this is at least in Finland, what has been really popular are VR solutions. And even though VR, in my opinion, is far from the, uh, let's say, device that would be available for the mortals. It's mostly for the companies or for the, let's say, developers who have it at home and so on. But basically VR is used heavily in Finland for various kinds of, of, of already for various uh, uh, educational and, uh, and therapy uses. And, and also, for example, in um, virtual uh, presentations, like let's say uh, for the architects, buildings, uh, I already said said about safety training and so on. So VR is definitely um, growing in that sense, but it's not yet as a B2C. It's still B2B mainly. So please have that in mind uh, when you are uh, uh, discussing that. And, um, and yeah. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, why, why to gamify in the, in the first place, well, creating this type of uh, immersive experience through gaming technology, no matter what technology you, you decide, I mean, it can be even web-based. It doesn't have to be mobile or console or VR or any. It can be literally as simple as a web application. Um, it gives more than traditional practices in a way that you can actually use different senses and different parts of your brain basically to interact with that uh, particular content that you want your user to, to, to interact with. And this has been really successful uh, in Western countries when it comes to helping children, uh, youth and people of all ages with various kinds of uh, physical or mental challenges and so on. So, so and, and trauma and whatnot. So these are the things that really to have in mind that there is a lot of potential. And as already uh, previously explained, like there is, um, you know, sky is far from the limit, <laughs> especially with the virtual reality, you can do so much uh, in so many ways. But these are some of the examples where you can actually really get not just this sort of like, you can also tackle uh, person's social uh, aspects and social kind of engagement with other players, but also with other, whichever things you want to focus on, again, depending on your uh, gamified solution. So, so here are some of the uh, things you can actually uh, affect on, like assertiveness, confidence, um, developing relationships, uh, empathy, soft skills as well. Um, problem solving skills, um, trust in others, but most importantly, trust in self, because this is again, how do you actually deal with, for example, failure? So trusting yourself that you can do and you can do better and go for. So this is, this is really important. And just to give briefly some of the biggest challenges that I would kind of like uh, want to just give few examples of the, there are lots of them actually, but just some of the main ones is, as I mentioned for with the teachers, really understanding who are your target users and who are, for example, facilitators, because teachers and your clients kind of who need that for their users, they're facilitators basically of that uh, platform. But you need to really, there is this sort of um, really uh, hard kind of, or, or thin line really understanding to, for whom you are actually creating the, the, um, the solution. And uh, also, especially in the story-driven experience, it's really important that user should always have this sort of focus of what really needs to be done and not to get distracted. 
because this is also another thing that can be really hard, kind of like from all the things that you have happening around, what is actually important, what is not? When do you have a story bit when you don't? And balancing these parts, this is designer's job, basically to, to really work uh, uh, closely with. And then creating this sort of bond with the user because uh, bigger bond there is, more engagement also on this learning and, and other aspects that you actually through gamification want to um, assert is exactly uh, what, you, what you want to also see, what works with what kind of people. And big challenge is also understanding where money comes from, because there is the B2B side and then there is B2Z kind of business models. So depending on the product and in what capacity it makes sense to go with the one, other, or both actually business models, because that's also possible. So, but this is something that is also quite misunderstood, kind of like how you can actually make money out of the gamified solutions. Um, so please have that in mind, like really do your research well. And one thing that ever, very often happens in gamified solutions is this, that you have, usually it's a client-based thing that you are kind of um, uh, getting, uh, let's say, uh, certain, certain, let's say, um, uh, requirements from a client that they need for, for their uh, gamified solution. And this is one of the good examples of what it really means to create it. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding also of what, again, I said, like who is actually the target audience and who is the facilitator and all that. So very being very clear, really what client needs or your partner in the project needs is that's where listening and co continuous communication happens because you don't want to go through this hell <laughs> in order to just get what you actually need. So listening, please don't forget that. And there is a second one client expectations versus client budget. Because very often in gamified solutions, uh, the budgets are much smaller than in uh, um, actual game production in, in, um, in the market, I mean, as a commercial games. So be honest to your client, what is actually possible to do with the available budget and what if it, if it all works out, meaning on the market and so on, how you can actually improve and get there to this kind of final expectations that they are having, but to get there, not necessarily immediately, but what would be the steps to do there? Because it's your job to educate them what is possible in, with the game technology, what is possible with the, uh, this sort of game design in general. So you are the expert, educate your clients. And don't be afraid also to say no to your certain ideas because that's your job. You have to tell them, how, how to, uh, because usually clients have no clue what they want or what they need, especially when it comes to gamification. Um, and now I would like to give you some examples of some of the, just some of the gamified solutions that we have done at MyTail. Um, so here is one uh, that we have for Viking Line. So Viking Line, for those who don't know, is they are the cruising cruising ships and uh, generally uh, like company from Finland, uh, which does cruising, but also different kind of, um, uh, let's say uh, transportation in, in a sense of goods and so on. And this, what you see here is not a photograph. This is the 3D model that we have been developing uh, VR and visualization solutions for them. Ship uh, has been built in China and while it was built in China, we had been building the virtual version of the ship, which then have been used for promotional material, um, VR training of the staff solution and so on. So you can use this kind of uh, approach to actually do it for like very Swiss for both sales and for actually uh, teams needs within the staff members. And just to clarify everything that you see here from these 3D models, is done with Blender. And Blender is free software to use. So there is, as, as Peter said, education and being kind of like learning new skills, learning all that. So this is all done in Blender, which you can download today and just 
<laughs> do it yourself. So no, no special magic or special expensive stuff. Everything has done here with the free software. Um, and here's another just example to give you kind of like what if for architects or for, because in Finland, this kind of having a cottage is very, very popular. So for example, using AR uh, to actually see where your cottage would be in the actual land that you own or how you can check different kind of buildings and their uh, structure or architects before they are even built. So this is one of the things we have been developing. And then for different clients, we have been developing different kinds of, um, this is for the uh, emotional fitness game for one of the clients of the, from UK, Equal. Um, and then um, uh, this is one of our products. Uh, we have been creating educational games also as a mobile free to play uh, games for where you, besides taking care of your pets uh, as, or, or your friends, you also have to take care of their uh, mental well-being and educa educating them, learning new skills as well as uh, other needs as a, as a kind of Tamagotchi part. And here is another where uh, we have been creating um, tools for speech and language therapy. And here is one of the interactive calendars uh, for uh, children and families with uh, uh, speech and language uh, imperative where they basically use mostly visual uh, stimuluses for communicating. And this is available in 25 languages. Uh, so just saying like this is, there are different things we have been developing for different needs of our clients, but also in our own. So this is our own product for speech and language therapy. Um, so yeah, I gave a lot of information today and I'm sure that there will be quite many questions, but as a summary to kind of like put down uh, to really what, what matters in, in, in gamification. Uh, make sure that you experiment as much as you can. And the reason behind that is that you actually see what works for your final user. So always user centric approach and get them involved as soon as you can in testing. As soon as you have anything on the screen moving, get them there, get the feedback, work with them fast and testing fast is crucial. Um, at the end of the day, stories and also generally kind of users, I mean, as the players, they are the creators of the fantasy. And we as developers, we create just the building box for them. So don't forget that. Make sure that you let them explore and learn things on their own way. And listening, nothing without listening, listening to your team, to yourself, you know, to your gut feeling, but also listening your uh, fellow co-creators, your clients, your users, and so on. So it's, it's really important. The, so, the soft skills are crucial when it comes to this industry, actually, how to make the most out of uh, the, uh, the final product, because again, for example, we don't know anything about certain topics or matters of listening that and also from our side, making sure that they understand what is technically possible and what kind of design solution would be the best fit for their needs. So yes, listening, very, very important. And yes, that would be all from me for today when it comes to the talk. Um, obviously I'm available for any kind of questions and comments now, but also feel free to be in touch later on as well. And I'm hoping to be in more of these events that we can continue discussions further. So thank you. Thank you, Natasha. This is the robot presentation. And I've learned a lot from this. In fact, I would really go over it again. I would love to. <laughs> yeah, well, as someone who is, to be honest, teaching, teaching these matters, I can literally talk about this <laughs> for days. Um, but I, I hope that I got the sort of like main aspects, like what to be aware of and, um, and kind of what, what challenges there really are, but also what beauty there is to, to create uh, gamified solutions. And um, yeah, it is, it is wonderful for game designers, especially to, to create this sort of, um, to take a challenge that for, especially if someone says, no, this cannot be done. 
or challenge accepted. <laughs> so let's find the solution. Let's see how we can actually make it work. Thank you very much. Um, do we, do, is anybody in the house uh, with questions? Ray, uh, you're muted. Ray, Ray, are you seeing something I can hear? I think you should be able to hear me now. Okay, we can hear yeah, you. We do. So, Excellent. Yeah, I, I muted my mic. Uh, so what I wanted to say is that in case you want, you would like to go over this presentation again, it will be made available on YouTube. So don't worry about about it if you don't have any question right now. You have a lot to learn from it. Yeah, First. absolutely. And you have yeah, and you have my contact. I'm always available to discuss, especially these topics, as as long as you want. So um, and yes, I will provide also uh, slides as well if anyone wants to have slides. You can. You're more than hey. welcome to have them. Well, as we move on on this project, um, we would love to have you again to, you know, shed light on one or two issues in terms of uh, we look up to you. Absolutely, so, anytime. I'm here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Nicole. Nicole in the house. Uh, yes, here? I am here. Okay. Um, okay, I would like you to talk about. Uh, Global Academy right now. Over to you. When I started the internship, um, it was first like not knowing what to do, uh, but but it's ha it has been a great time meeting lots of new people, and uh, I love the I'll, one of my favorite parts that you can work at any time you want, and we have like weekends for breaks that was very nice and we also learned here to how to properly develop games and we have taken this as notes like we shall first do the planning before doing the thing first because at the at first we at first, we just started doing whatever we wanted on plan, uh, but then we realized that it's better to just do some liking, like a drawing on paper for how it should look first, then we do the work afterwards. Um, that's something I have learned, and it has been a great experience, something really great. I just, I'm happy to be with. I am happy to be working here. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Nicole. Um, thank you very much, uh, listeners. Okay, to the next session. Okay. We can agree that language is a very powerful and essential heritage of the world. It should be preserved for the benefit of mankind and future of the world. You know, uh, few few facts and research says uh, at least forty three percent of the estimated six thousand languages spoken in the world are endangered. Languages are prone to endangerment due to the following: you know, uh, migration, people moving from one location to the other, um, also economic or social power, or the non challenged uh, efforts of parents, uh, elders of the community to adopt and learn or put, uh, a, a, to put a system in place to make the modern tongue the first language. So as such, if that's not in place, it goes to extinction. So also, once a language reaches endangerment, the speaker, the people that speak the language, the, the crazy and children are most likely not to you know, get this heritage. So we, we've been talking about game scenes we've been talking about. So what's our own you know, game? What do we want to be? What are we building? What are we working on? That takes us to toy, toy culture. Toy culture is our product. It's a mobile game solution to preserve endangered languages globally, mostly mother tongue. It's a 3D game designed to make any mother tongue interesting, simple, easy to learn in a fun field way for children from the age of four to 11 years old. The game is planned to be optimized as an educational tool to teach children mother tongue at home 
and at the school. We've done a lot of work already. The project uh, empowered you to be an internship. You can hear Nicole speaking about uh, the Red Group at the Academy. Um, thesis work, learning at work for career planning and preparedness to, for, for the competence demonstration through the guidance that we provide to students during the project process in Finland and other countries that collaborated. The first game prototype is aimed at teaching Yoruba language from Nigeria. Yoruba language is spoken in West Africa, uh, mostly predominantly in Southwestern Nigeria. Yoruba speakers are estimated to be about 45 to 55 million in the world. Also, it's spoken in Benin, Republic of Benin and Togo with smaller you know, migration in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Syria alone, the Gambia, as well as Brazil in uh, Rio de Janeiro and Salvador. So we can see that uh, the first prototype of the gaming is next week. Um, okay, we would love you to also attend. The event link will be posted in the chat and comment area. You can register and make plans to attend. As you can see, we've done a lot of work already. We need your support. Together we can make this work. You kindly support us via our crowdfunding link, which will also be posted and uh, comment area. So we, your support will not be taken for granted. This is a big project. We also have reward packages for anyone that supports, just to appreciate your kind gesture. You can check the link for more info, the comment uh, area. Thank you very much. So um, moving to the next, uh, to our next speaker, Mr. Kayode Oloko. Mr. Kayode um, has language proficiency in Yoruba, English, Russian, Finnish, uh, presently learning his fifth language. He loves to travel around. He loves to travel. I think travel is one of the favorite hobbies. He has lived in um, Philippines before and Hawaii, Finland. He is currently working. He has worked, pardon me. He has worked with the sales department, Hello. uh, Brella. He's also the oh. founder of um, a B follower on show. He mentioned this earlier when he was introducing himself. Mm. He, where he works as a scriptwriter and a producer of kid based animation series, which now shows on YouTube. Hello. Hello. Mr. Kayo, are you? There? Um, yes, I am. How are you? Mm. Over to you for the presentation, sir. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so, thank you. Um, actually, it's been a privilege, you know. Um, listening to the speakers before me. Um, Natasha, thank you very much. You've been able to drop a whole lot of knowledge on my brain. <laughs> While you were talking, I was just, you know, trying to Google more stuff, you know. Um, thank you for that. Um, so once again, my name is Kayade. I'm a very big lover of um, language, um, just like um, the last person said, I think Gregory. And um, so, um, let's dive into the main reason why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the sales part. Um, basically, um, as you all see, the emoji is love instead of money, <laughs> because um, quite a number of time everybody thinks about money when it comes to sales. But um, I actually kind of have a different approach to sales because whenever I, I, I think of sales, the only thing I think about is passion. Um, no matter, you know, the good news, maybe it's it's your crowdfunding or you've been able to buy a car or you've been able to sell a car. The most important thing that that works in, in that region is love because you have the, the passion for something that you've been able to buy and you or probably you've had the passion for something that you've been able to sell. Um, so let's just um, dive in into the into the main topic, um, talking about, you know, um, startups funding, being an entrepreneur, what does it look like also, you know, for those of you in the game industry trying to move forward, um, you know, it, it's, it's basically the backbone of everything in life. And um, it, it's actually been a very good, um, good, good news for, for me to read through that the African startups were able to raise over $1 billion in funding in 2020, despite the pandemic. Um, I mean, um, the, the funding has actually come across different sectors, um, and that was what Kuridi was trying to say, but then I would, I would talk about it in, in, in more, more once we go deep into the, into the conversation. Um, and then, you know, the fact, I, I mean, I, I think the first time I heard about toy culture, it was something of joy for me, um, because then, you know, it affected languages, it was going to 
you know, find a solution to it. And, you know, and it was something that I felt like, well, how are they going to get the funding done? And, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is there has to be a lot of job, you know, being done. And um, as you can see also, you know, Nigerian startups are, are actually doing a lot. Um, even though Korea is based in Nigeria and in Finland, you can see that he's trying to do something that is, you know, th they are going to be solving a, a problem that affects quite a number of people, even here in Helsinki. Um, anyways, as you can see, the Nigerian startups has been able to raise 17% of the total $1 billion, you know, dollars. And, um, and this is, this is, actually a very good news you know to in if you were a startup or or you're thinking of, of in a startup um so when we're talking about um about about the idea of you you know being when you think about how do you finance your project um the first thing that comes to your mind is am i meant to wait for investors or investors are meant to look for me um, the big news, the happy news, and the sad news <laughs> is that you actually need to be the one to look for investors. And um, in sales, we actually call that the outbound. And that is something I've, I've actually been doing for the past five years. Um, right now, I'm actually still working with Brella. And um, I'm also doing the same thing. And then basically in sales, is either you, you're doing inbound, which most likely is not the case when you're looking for investors. Um, but then outbound is what you actually really do need to do because then you have to be the ones looking for the funding, looking for the investors. And uh, um, these are, this are the things I've actually done in the last five years, I'm um, sorry. Um, basically, it's, it's the ability for you to be able to find your prospects. Um, the prospects here could be investors. This, this, um, the prospects here could be, you know, um, non-government organizations that are willing, you know, to work and finance project um the next step would actually be for you to find the right person you know um bracket open decision maker because you actually don't have time to waste you want to be able to talk to the right person as soon as possible and after that you want to be able to you know schedule a meeting and um it's always a good idea for you to be able to have something in the calendar um you know to make things official and you know that actually gives you time to prepare um after the meeting is done um, there, there needs to be a follow-up because um, from the meeting, you would actually need to know how to move forward um, in terms of, is this, is this going to lead to you, you know, closing a deal? Is it going to lead to you benefiting financially from, from the meeting you've just had? Or at the same time, it could just lead to you, you know, trying again. It's, it could be a closed loss. And, um, you know, the most important thing you need to learn from this stage is that whatever that has that has made you lose that case you need to be able to work on it and then you try again and you know depending on on how tedious or or how many you know obstacles you had you need to keep trying again so over to the next slide um i mean umbrella here where i'm working where i've been able to learn um i've been able to learn it's always a learning curve every day when it comes to sales um trying to improve and get better um the basic you know the basic the basic things and fundamentals you need you know for you to be able to look for that funding is to ask yourself um what what are the driving tools you need you know um from a modern salesperson's perspective um the most important thing is you need to be systematic at your work it comes first um systematic at your work means that how you know you need to decide on what approach works for you um, for example, me being systematic at my work is that I definitely know I'm an early morning coffee type of person. I get things more done in the morning because I have more energy. I have more, you know, more, more ideas flowing in my head. So you have to be systematic at your work. You need to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, the next stage is you actually need a lot, lots of discipline um, in terms of you being able to achieve your objective. It's, it's discipline. Um, there's a time to drink, there's a time to party, there's a time to sleep, and there's a time to work. Um, you also need to stay focused um, in, in achieving your aim. And then the next one, which is actually very, very important, is you actually need to be intentional. Intentional in the aspect of whenever you're getting into a conversation to talk about your product, you need to understand what you want to get 
out of that conversation even before you start that conversation. So every conversation is intentional. Then the next step, which is actually the most important is, it's, it's, it's one of the most important also, is that you need to have a very good knowledge of the industry. I mean, the gamification aspect, you need to have an idea of, you know, how, how have the, the big guns been able to win? And if there've been any losses from there, what have they lost? You need to be able to understand all of this, you know, from the top notch to the, to the down end, you need to understand everything about the industry, the big players. If you're, if you're an early startup, you need to be able to understand who are those that are coming behind you. You know, what sort of niche markets, what sort of products are they bringing in? Um, at the same time, you need to be data driven. You need to be able to understand that every investor, they love to understand, they love to, to hear those numbers. They, they wanna listen to them. You know, they might not really be able to, they, the, they might not be able to get the old basic picture, but numbers do sound good. So moving forward, um, I mean, Corey Diaz, um, in his speech, you know, he made us, made us feel aware of the fact that um, there's, there's been not, not as big of a win, you know, in the, in the gaming industry. And I actually do agree. Um, I'm going to be showing that in the next slide. But at the same time, there have actually been some very few wins. Um, for example, Carry First, you know, in, it's, it's a South African based company and, um, you know, back to back, they've been able to, 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 to have two major wins, you know, 2.5 million, $6 million. It, those are not, you know, those are not just mistake fundraising. No, they actually did their work. They were able to convince the investors and the investors got the idea. So this actually also shows that the gamification industry in Nigeria is something to look out for. Um, so this is, you know, a very um, big, I decided to share this because then I wanted you guys to have an idea of, of um, what the gaming, you know, um, financial um, side looked like. Um, and, and as you can see here, there's a couple of, you know, um, game companies. As you can see here, um, these are seeds, you know, and, and this is actually quite in interesting. So this is where I actually agree. 100% with what Corey Day said about the fact that, you know, um, the gamification industry is likely to be the, the biggest thing, but at the same time, um, um, they, they are still, I think I would like to use the word lacking behind, um, because then as you can see, one, two, three, you know, seeds basically means that friends and families and probably, you know, um, random people who are interested you know, we're able to, to donate into those projects. And um, it actually says a lot about the markets. You know, the, the positive thing it has been able to say about the markets is that people understand that this could be the next big thing. As you can see here, um, the Chess Cube have been, have been able to have venture funding. Um, you can actually see um, Lumino Loops have been able to have equity crowdfunding. You know, not a lot, if you check the top 20 list, not a lot of them have been able to have venture or equity crowdfunding. Um, but at the same time, I think the big win for this is that the seed aspect, the fact that family, friends, and, you know, people who actually have the passion for what they see in the gamification industry um, is actually something, you know, something we need to appreciate. And, you know, it shows that this could be the next big thing. Uh, so, oh, wait, I have no idea why this is not moving. Okay. Um, so why do investors, how do investors step They Yeah. So why investors should step in? Sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's Friday evening. I'm, I'm ready for, for the party. So you have to forgive me. Um, anyways, moving forward. Um, so why investors should step in? I mean, it's, it, those are the big questions, you know, um, right now, the gamification industry in Africa is a niche market, um, niche product also. Um, the, the big question is where investors ask themselves is what problem are you solving? And it, it's, it's clearly seen that there's a, there's a problem to solve. Um, I, I mean, taking toy culture, for example, um, you, you can see clearly that it's going to be solving problems for over 60 million people around the world. And that, that's a big number. 
Um, do they have a prototype? You, you need to ask yourself as, as an entrepreneur or a startup, you know, um, because every investor out there loves prototypes. And, you know, for me being Yoruba, it's, it's something amazing that, you know, I, they, they've actually decided to, to prototype Yoruba language. Um, and then, you know, according to statistics, you know, you have to make sure that your startup has great potential. And um, a lot of investors also, you know, they, they get to invest in companies to have a sense of fulfillment. Um, so, so let me give you an example of what that means is that I'm a language lover. So definitely um, I'm going to be donating to, to toy culture because it's definitely going to give me a sense of fulfillment knowing that I'm playing my part to the fact that my language or any language out there would make go into extinction. So, so those are some of the, the, the top notch of what's, investors you know look for and you should also ask yourself so how do investors step in you know the the big major truth i mean from my point of view is funding um and um there are four different investment contracts you know and um everything as it, it depends on you as a startup i think natasha also mentioned that that you need to be aware you need to be able to know what you can give and what you cannot give um, so having all of this in mind, you can decide, like, you know, taking myself as an example for a B for Lauren Shaw, um, a lot of people have asked me, you know, why don't I have stock? Why, why can't I make it possible for people to buy shares in it? And the truth, the truth of the matter is I still have no idea how to do that. So what I've actually done is I'm actually at the seed process of family and friends and um and well wishes or those who are learning from it. So this is something that every you know gamification startup um, um, or entrepreneur needs to understand. That look at it's 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 okay. And just like what Natasha said, it's it's one process at a time. You need to be able to know what you can deliver. Um, so the biggest thing out of it is you need to understand that as from now moving forward. You need to act like a salesperson. You need to get your hands dirty. You need to go out there. You need to be systematic with your work. You need to be disciplined. You know, you need to, to, to be intentional in everything you do. And do not forget that you need to study hard. You need to have the knowledge of the industry, you know, to be able to get the most out of investors, out of well-wishers, or out of family and friends who would want to contribute, or even even you meeting someone randomly in the airplane um, and you have a conversation with them about your projects and you know you need to be able to, to spread the word. So thank you very much. I, I hope I've not been able to waste your time. And um, yes, I'm done. Thank you so much for the amazing uh, presentation. We'd like to say a very special thank you to all our speakers from today. Uh, we have learned a lot and uh, it's been an amazing, amazing time. Thank you to everybody for the awesome time to all the participants and also to the speakers. It has been very amazing to have you all here. And really quickly, I'll talk about the new session that starts with uh, Ray Global Digital Academy. Uh, this session starts in August, on the 9th of August, 2021, and we are offering three months training to every interested uh, African-based youth in attendance today. Uh, to enroll at Ray Global Digital Academy, you follow a link which would be in the, in the chat section. So kindly uh, put in an application there. It's a very simple one. Just your name, where you're from, and all your all your other details. There's also opportunities to to become a volunteer because we we need more hands on deck. So if you are interested, if you feel like this is a project that you would also like to be a part of, kindly also put in an application to be a volunteer. So. Ray Global Digital Academy basically is going to be focusing on a few courses, which includes the game development. You need a couple of uh, prerequisites for this. 
for the game de development, for example, you need the basic knowledge of Unity or, or Blender or C++ or C Sharp. And the audio visualize, visual production in game development as well, you need a little bit of music instrumentation and music production. And there's also gonna be teaching on Adobe Creative Cloud. So do we have any other Ray Global digital students here right now that would like to share their experience from the academy in general, or would just like to say a few words on how their experience have been, what they've done, et cetera. Just a little sneak peek before next week. Yeah, let's start with Alex. I'm Alexi, I'm studying game graphics in Helsinki. And I've been working here in the in the game with the game in Ray Global Digital for almost three months now. And uh, overall the, the experience has been positive. Uh, what I did in the, the game, I did some planning and sketching of the map. Uh, environment, interactive elements, obstacles, mini games, uh, etc. And uh, I also did uh, mock up animation of the gameplay together with the sound designer. So we got the animation video with sounds. And uh, yeah, a lot of the work was uh, independent, but uh, also needed to work like a, as a team member. Uh, me talk with the elders and discuss the task and so on. And uh, anyway, I learned a lot in the in the internship and it was pretty fun. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alexi. Anybody yeah. else? Any interested oh, yeah. persons? Laya, go ahead. I don't think anytime you want to speak, always turn on your videos. Um, I don't think Laya has video, so we we'll bear with her. Yeah, so yeah, I'm sorry that I don't have a video or anything. But yeah, I'm also an intern and I've been doing this almost for three months now. And I've done 3D models <clears throat> and character animations in this internship. And when I think of this internship, I, I would say it, it it was good. I liked it. I uh, learned a lot about teamwork and especially about myself, about my own interest and own like abilities to do work and all of that. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say. So, yeah. Thank you, Lahia. Are we expecting somebody else? I don't think so. Okay, so don't forget to join us for the next seminar, which is going to be next week on the 24th of June, where we'll be taking a sneak peek into the game itself. We are preserving endangered languages and the students have done amazing work on the project and we hope to show a prototype by next week. Right now I'm going to give the stage over to Corey De Bello to give some last thank yous and some I don't know. All right. Ginger. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. I definitely care for uh, moderating this uh, program today. Um, I want to use this time to say a special thank you to all our special guests. Natasha, thank you very much for a very in-depth into the uh, introduction part of game development. That was so informative. And of course, it is very, very useful for us, especially at our regular body academy. Thank you so much for being on board. Um, also, Coyote, thank you so much. That was a very nice one. Um, because judging from the fact that to get information, there, there is not so much research that has gone into game industry in Nigeria. It's, but you were able to pull that off. That was so superb. 
Nice. Thank you so much, Coyote. Um, also, I would like to say a special thank you to um, our business director in Nigeria, with the business director of Re Global Digital um, in Nigeria, um, um, Gregory Ayodeji, for moderating this program. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, for what you did. And Adefunke, our research uh, manager, thank you so much, Adefunke, for hosting. Uh, last but, but not the least, I would like to say a special thank you to everybody that joined. But right now, I want to do something. Can you all turn on your video, please? And I want uh, somebody to take a screenshot of every one of us. Um, I didn't forget if you can do that, please. It would be nice. Everybody, turn on your video. I would like to see your wonderful faces, your beautiful faces, your handsome faces. It's been a very nice time to have everybody on board. It's been very nice. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, yeah. So, Alexi, you can also take a screenshot just to be safe. Uh, from there, we want to see the faces of everybody. There are some faces that I'm seeing for the first time. Um, if you you if you if you did not we were not around when we all introduced ourselves, can you quickly introduce yourself? We would like to meet you. Anybody? Nobody. All right. So thank you, everybody. This is just the beginning. We are going to be doing this seminar from time to time. It's about bringing more awareness to African. Uh, game development in Africa. I'm so excited about this. It's like I'm treating it like a baby. It's a, it's, a, it's a baby that I'm so proud of. And I want to say thank you. Thank you, everybody. If you notice that there is something that we are doing that we need to do it better, you can always get in touch with us. Uh, check all our social media, especially from LinkedIn. Um, write us, advise us, encourage us, mentor us. We can't do this alone. Sincerely, we really need you. We can't do without you, just know that. And I also, I would like to also recommend that, please fund us, support us financially. We can't do without funding, reality. Please jump on, uh, come on board uh, with our crowdfunding, check it out. And, don't, um, and also we are not asking you to, blind, uh, to fund us blindly. Um, attend the, um, our first prototype. It's our first prototype. It's not that the game is totally finished, but we just want to show off what we have done um, since January. So thank you, everybody. Uh, right now, we are going to be calling this a day, and I will give it uh, back to a different case, as we say goodbye, right? Yeah, just take it over. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone. It was a pleasure. And we're looking forward to the next uh, seminars and events. Yeah, thank you. And don't forget to send us your email. We would like to uh, send um, a kind of um, a questionnaire to you just to tell us what you think about this. We want to get better next time. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely